Well, welcome. Um, I'm very excited about our discussion tonight. I think we are going to just so enjoy looking at three things, the Akedah, the Passover, and then the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, the Akedah, you may know, is the Jewish description for the binding of Isaac. Uh, that's uh, the word uh, he bound Isaac is uh, a kada uh, or a kad in Hebrew, and so Jews will call that event the Akeda. We're going to look in depth at that, at the details of it, kind of take it as a practice study of how to study scripture. Uh, we're going to do the same thing with the Passover, and then briefly at the very end, we're going to look at the Mosaic Covenant. But before we look at the Akedah in details, uh, what are observations do you have from the text? You did the homework, you looked at the various thing. What do you find interesting? What do you find challenging? What do you find confusing uh, about what you did in the worksheet this week? Yeah, and it looks like that isn't going to be true, uh, and then it is going to be true. So, kind of a strange thing. Do you think that Abraham thought that? Well, it is inter <laughs> it is interesting that he says we will worship, mm -hmm. and we will return. Um, Maybe he had the expectation that since God promised that Isaac would be the one, maybe he had an expectation. Certainly the writer of Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews says that Abraham thought uh, God would raise Isaac from the dead. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure I would have been able to get that on my own, but the writer of Hebrews, uh, that's what he says, was running through Abraham's mind. And so... It's hard to know exactly um, what he's expecting at each point, but it is strange. I mean, those words are very strange. We will worship. We will return. Uh, God will provide for himself the lamb. <clears throat> when God does provide, at least in the immediate story, it's not a lamb that's provided. It's a ram. So... Uh, we're left wondering, well, exactly what are these details about? Um, why are they there? What else did you find interesting about the work you did on the homework? I think it'd be easier to know kind of what was going on if you could discern what some emotions were. But in the reading, there's just, like in the story, there's, there's no emotions expressed. Um, you, know, you know that it's got to be an emotion-packed yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Abraham, we know Abraham is more than 100 years old because Isaac wasn't born until Abraham was 100. We're going to see that uh, Jewish interpreters all affirm that Isaac is a grown man when this happened, not a small child. And if we say 20, I think uh, Josephus uh, says he thought Isaac was about 20. That would make Abraham 120. And he had longed for Isaac for 30 years. So this is 50 years into the promise, kind of on a minimum reading. And then what? I mean, God just says, kill him. Uh, and not just kill him, uh, offer him as a burnt offering. That's terrifying. And the fact that the scripture says, and he got up and obeyed, that, that's amazing in the story. Well, let's dive in together and look at some of this. And what I want to do is... 
the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And learning how to read the Bible as a commentary on the Bible is going to help us immensely. Um, we can get a lot of this by just looking up the cross-references. Um, you may or may not know that the Akedah is actually quoted in Jesus' baptism. Uh, so I want to read this and see how is Jesus' baptism understanding the Akeda and then go back and read the Old Testament text. So Jesus' baptism, this is from Matthew, says this, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness, then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Now, when you and I read that, as 21st century Americans, probably not much Old Testament jumps off the page to you at that point. For a Jewish reader, there are at least three things that would just absolutely jump off the page. And those three things are going to help us when we are reading the Old Testament, uh, understand how to put the pieces together. The first thing is this phrase, the heavens were open to him. That's a quotation from Ezekiel 1. When Ezekiel was 30 years old, God called him to be a prophet. And as his first experience, he sees the heavens opened. And so when Jesus is baptized, and we're going to see Luke tells us that he was about 30 years old when he was baptized, that it's clear that the writers are connecting Jesus is kind of the super prophet. Uh, Ezekiel started his ministry at 30. Jesus started his public ministry at 30 with his baptism. The second thing, the spirit descending on him like a dove. And remember I said last week that all <coughs> names in the Bible mean something. Uh, there aren't any names in the Bible that are, aren't actually words from the language. And that works in both... Uh, Greek and Hebrew. So one of the things you can always do uh, when you're studying any story is to look up what the names mean. And if we had thoroughly done that in the Old Testament, we would know that the word Jonah means the dove. Jonah means the dove. And so here, uh, kind of a blessing that's very disturbing. <laughs> uh, uh, we have uh, Jesus as the super prophet um, being identified as, as the super Jonah, the one who would preach repentance to the rebellious city. Uh, if we were really into the Old Testament, we would know that Jonah was from a place called Gath Hefer. Uh, which if we looked it up on a map, we would see it's Nazareth. So Jesus is from Jonah's hometown. Jesus is kind of uh, this new Jonah. And also with going through the waters at baptism, you might recall that uh, when the Noah's flood event is over, the thing that signals the end of God's judgment is a dove coming um, going out and coming in. So all those are beginning to coalesce uh, in this event in the baptism of Jesus. And we can see that Mark makes that same thing, saw the heavens open, the spirit descending. And Mark also includes this phrase, you are my beloved son. And when we go to Luke, we see that he actually helps us identify the Ezekiel text and saying that Jesus was about 30 years old. You may or may not know that 
priest began to serve at 30 years old, from 30 years old to 50 years old. Uh, and when you were ordained as a priest, you were washed by a Levite when you were 30 years old, and that was part of the process of becoming a priest. Jesus is washed by a Levite, John. Uh, John's father was a Levite. Uh, Zechariah married to Elizabeth, who is Mary's relative. Um, you become a priest, so Jesus, 30 years old, is being washed by a Levite. Uh, perhaps presenting Jesus as the ultimate uh, priest, and you may or may not know this, but David uh, died when he was 70 years old. He reigned 40 years, and you put that together, it means that David becomes king when he's 30. So Jesus, as prophet, priest, and king, is coalescing all those Old Testament stories into one uh, elegant, uh, plot symmetrical meta narratival uh, artistry by God. But what about this phrase, my, you are my beloved son? Now, this is the text in Greek of those two. Uh, well, it's the one from Luke, but we could have put the one from Mark as well. Ha huios mu ha agapetos. Um, and you can probably hear the word agape in there. You are my son, my agapetos son. You are my son, my beloved son. Now, if we were Jewish people, Theological bells would be going off in our mind because that's a direct quote of the Akedah. In Genesis 22:2, God says to Abraham, Take your son, and I've put it in a way easy for us to compare, Ha Huiasu, your son. God is saying, This is Ha Huias Mu my son, so the only difference between those is one letter uh, in the text. Um, God is saying, you remember that heart-wrenching story in Genesis 22? That was about Abraham's beloved son. This is about my son. It's a direct verbatim quote of the Akedah. It's inviting us into the world of comparison, of comparing the event that happened in the Akedah with the event that happens with Jesus. And so that's what we want to do. We want to carefully read the text. We want to tease out uh, details. We want to ask great questions as we come to this text. And so here are some of the things that I just want us to think about as we dive into this text together. After these things, God, and in Hebrew, this is the word Elohim. And that's going to be very important a little later in this story. After these things, Elohim tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. So we're going to see in this story, there's a parallel between Abraham being uh, God's son, just like David is God's son and Israel is God's son, quintessentially Abraham uh, is functioning in, in that close relationship with God. Um, this same address is going to be between Isaac and Abraham. And so there's a connection here between God as a loving father and his obedient son, uh, Abraham. Here I am. And then Elohim says the unthinkable to Abraham. Take your son. Ha huios mu Ha Agapitas, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, 
go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall tell you. Now, if we're 21st century Americans, we read that and that's shocking. Uh, what God is asked Abraham uh, to do is shocking. It's even more shocking to Jewish people because Jewish people know what a burnt offering was and we don't. So I'm going to describe a burnt offering. Uh, I hope you don't have a queasy stomach. Um, this is shocking, uh, but this is verbatim how you make a burnt offering. Uh, when you make a burnt offering, the priest uh, will slit the throat of the animal. And as the animal uh, bleeds and uh, whelps and cries out, its life will wane. Um, are any of you hunters at all? Uh, tell me about uh, killing an animal and draining the blood out of a large animal. Walk me through how you would do that if you were in the woods somewhere. Pretty much how it goes is <clears throat> If you shoot a deer and you get up and the deer's still alive, and they're usually always are, um, you get your knife and you go up and you grab its head, pull it up, and slit its throat. And then you wait, and it's pretty brutal. And uh, when you slit its throat, does blood go everywhere? It just starts to seep out and just pour out. And then if you're going to dress that animal, hang it up. you hang it out. You get a rope or something. You find a tree. Mm -hmm. You tie the rope around the hind legs or something. And um, you, just, you just sit there for and it runs out and it takes a while. But. You, you hoist it up and then uh, this gruesome event, um, you hang it up and the blood just comes out and then um, you flay the animal and um, that is a gruesome process uh, you cut uh, extremities and you slice the skin and you begin to pull it apart and rip the skin off of uh, the animal and uh, what's left is uh, skin and the gut sack and you have uh, the skin. Now in a burnt offering, the skin was the payment that you gave the priest for offering your, so in a burnt offering, the skin was the only thing that survived. Um, it was the payment given to the Levitical priest. Um, God is asking Abraham to serve as a priest and offer his son. And so the image of slitting his son's throat, of hanging his son up, of draining the blood out of his son, of stripping the skin off, and then uh, he would keep that as his payment for serving as priest. And then once you have it hanging up, you do something. What do you do? And uh, that's called the gut sack. And do you pierce the gut sack? You don't want to. You don't want to. And why do you not want to pierce the gut sack? Well, it smells and it gets messy. And it makes poison meat. It reeks to high heaven. And so you're trying to get that out of the gut of the animal without piercing it. You want to get it out as a whole. And then once you get that out and it's ripping out the insides, um, you have the meat left. And in a burnt offering, you would have to quarter that meat. So once you've got the animal hanging up, you would cut it in sections. 
And then uh, piece by piece, you would put those pieces on a, a fire and you're trying to get the fire so hot that it burns everything up. Uh, you're trying to get it hot enough to burn even the bones up. Um, that's what God is asking Abraham to do. To the son that he has waited 50 years for this fellowship, the son whose name means laughter, the sun who is the sparkling, shiny, shining point of his life. Without saying, I know this is going to be hard. Without saying, trust me. He says, Abraham, do this. I don't know what you would say. I know what my flesh would say. My flesh would say, I'm not going to do it. My flesh would say, God, how could you possibly ask me to do this? Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, notice there's one donkey, took two of his young men, two of his, it says boys in Hebrew, not Arim. Uh, boy is what you call any unmarried man. Um, David's commander of the army, Zadok, is called a Naar. Um, Jacob is called a Naar when he's 70 years old and unmarried. Uh, so not our boy or same word later I am the lad will go I am the not our will go doesn't imply little person it just implies unmarried man they sat on one donkey took two of his not ours with him and his son Isaac he cut the wood for the burnt offering so this donkey isn't for Abraham to ride on uh, the Abraham, the two servants, and Isaac will walk. The donkey is for the wood. And I'm told that if you want to know how much wood it takes to burn up a human body, there's actually a website you can go to. Um, it's over a thousand pounds of wood uh, to burn up a human body. That seems very strange. To me. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men, cut the wood. On the third day, he lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Now, if we teased out the details, uh, they go on a journey 43 miles uh, from Beersheba to Moriah. And if you want to know what 43 miles is, if you can put yourself at Clumpy's on the North Shore, and if you've ever driven to Bryan College, that's 43 miles. So imagine four people walking over the course of three days. It's almost that same terrain, long uphill walk, uh, that's where they're going. And you can imagine every step for this 120-year-old man as he's walking, knowing that when he gets to the end, pierce, don't pierce the gut suck, flay, dismember, and then burn him up until there's nothing left. And since you're serving as priest, Abraham, you get to keep the skin of your son as the payment for your priestly duty. Now, I don't know about you, but you talk about emotions. Um, the bitter, the only way to describe that journey is bitter. Um, bitter, dread, and for us as observers, it's, Abraham, why are you doing this? 
why are you obeying God? God's being unreasonable here. Enormous faith on Abraham's part. And then we have this. Then Abraham said to his Naarim, uh, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy, I and the Naar, I and the unmarried man uh, will go over there. And then this is what it says in Hebrew. We will worship. And then this is what it verbatim says in Hebrew. And we will return. Now I don't know about you, but I read that sentence. We will worship. I'm not sure I could describe slitting my beloved son's throat, flaying his skin, uh, taking the gut sack out of his body and dismembering what's left and then burning it up until there was nothing left. I'm not sure I could describe that as we will worship. And I certainly could not say we will return. Now the writer of Hebrews says Abraham at that point understood uh, or was beginning to understand that God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. Maybe Abraham realized that God had given the promise that it was Isaac who was going to have offspring like the uh, stars uh, in the heavens. And maybe Abraham realized, well, if I kill him and God promised that he was the one, then it must mean that God or is intending to raise him from the dead. I'm, I'm going to burn his body up, but God has made the promise to, to this physical human being, and if God made a promise, he's gonna keep his word, and so maybe God's gonna raise him from the dead. Uh, extraordinary faith that God has given Abraham at this point. We will worship, we will come again to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. That seems beyond the pale to me. I mean, you've got this donkey who's carried, I mean, hundreds of pounds of wood, if not a thousand pounds of wood, 43 miles. Why not make the donkey carry the wood up the hill and then build the altar. But Abraham says no. Abraham is making his beloved son carry the wood on which he will die up the hill to Mount Moriah. Then the text said he took in his hand the fire and knife. So the two of them went on together. Isaac said, to his father Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. That's the same thing Abraham said to God. You can see this loving uh, relationship. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac knew what they were gonna do. Isaac had seen this happen before, and Abraham says God will provide for himself a lamb. The Hebrew there is a little quirky. It, it could be translated, God will see for himself the lamb, a, a lamb. Um, but it's strange because everything in the text says Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac as the lamb, but now he's saying, to Isaac, God will provide the lamb. So both of them went on together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, 
and then bound Isaac. That's where we get the word akeda from, the binding. And then laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, if we were Jewish people and we were studying with a rabbi and asked the question, Rabbi, how old is Isaac when this happened? And uh, rabbi might say, well, how old do you think he was? And we might say, well, he was six years old. And the rabbi would laugh at us and say, oh, dear child, no, 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 he, he has to be a grown man. And we might say, Rabbi, prove to me he's a grown man. And the rabbi is going to say, well, how much wood does it take to burn up a human body? And if it takes a massive amount of wood to burn up a human body, then it implies that Isaac was a grown man. If we read the next story, uh, when uh, Isaac's mother, Sarah, dies, Isaac's 37 years old when that happens. Jews say that it was a story of what almost happened to Isaac that killed her. I don't know if that's the case or not, but that uh, Jews tell the story that uh, Abraham related and it was so overwhelming that she died. She died at 127 years old. She was 90 when he was born. He's 37 years old. He's an old person when this happened, an older person. Let's say he's 20 years old. That makes, that's what Josephus says, that makes Abraham 120 years old. And the rabbi might point to us that Isaac was a willing sacrifice. And what's the reasoning there? Right. I mean, my son was five years old. We would go for a run. He could outrun me all day long. I was old when he was born. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, if you had to put your money on a 20-year-old man or a 120-year-old man, um, if the 20-year-old man wants to get away, he's going to get away. And so Jewish people perhaps rightly recognize that he's um, willingly submitting to the will of his father. He knew what a burnt offering was like. He knew what it was like to take an animal's head and pull it back and then cut its throat. And now all of a sudden, Isaac is willing to obey his father and his father is going to do this unreasonable thing. Abraham reached out his hand. I have a quibble with the ESV there. I think that's a mistranslation. Um, the text literally says Abraham sent his hand. It was as if he couldn't even make himself, he was having to send his hand to take the knife. And I have a quibble there of translating a knife. It really, it's the slaughtering knife, the, the knife that eats. Uh, so think of a huge, uh, just a butcher knife. But then notice this detail in the story. But the angel of Yahweh. Now who commanded this to be done? Elohim. Elohim. And who's stopping it? Yahweh. The, angel the angel of Yahweh is stopping it. Elohim commanded it. The angel of Yahweh. Is that the normal prerogative of an angel? To countermand an order from God? Look exactly what he says. This is bizarre to me. Then the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Usually the angel of the Lord is on the earth and God is in heaven. Now it's the angel of Yahweh in heaven. And said to him, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything for now I know that you fear Elohim. Uh, 
Okay, that's that's right. Now I know that you fear Elohim, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, and it should say from him. But that's not what it says. You have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Elohim commanded it done. The Malach Adonai countermanded it. And then is speaking of Elohim in the third person, but then applying to himself the one who asked it to be done. There are two figures in this passage that are speaking as God. That's strange. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. God said, provide a lamb, but this is a ram caught in a thicket, or you might translate this a thorn thicket. That's interesting. Thorns around the head of this ram. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. This is where we get that song from. And that's what appears in the Hebrew text. Uh, uh, Yahweh, uh, which some people pronounce Jehovah. Uh, Yireh will provide, will see to it. And can you at least hear that Mariah and Yira may be related, like in terms of provision, seeing. Okay, go to the land of Moriah. Um, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. In other words, after that event was done, people kept saying, it is going to happen on Moriah. It will be provided on Moriah. And we might ask the question, it what? And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. That's weird. I thought this was the angel of the Lord. By myself I have sworn declares the Lord because you have done this and not withheld your son your only son I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven the sand is on the seashore your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring all the nations of the earth be blessed so Abraham returned to the young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba the 43 miles back home This is a strange, strange, strange story. The details. Did you pick up those weird details when you read it? Or uh, are we like, and we all do this, do we not? We just read it and we kind of never ask these questions, these kind of detail questions. Perhaps that's a mistake when we do that. Perhaps uh, we're reading the text too quickly. So one of the things that will always help you in studying any story is to look up the meaning of names. And that is massively important when you look at the word Mariah. Now, uh, I want to try to teach you a little something about the Hebrew text. Um, So this is the Hebrew text. This is what it looks like. This is the verse that has Moriah. And do you see the things that are turning on and off? Okay. So in Hebrew, those are the vowel points. And Moses and David and 
Ezekiel had never seen anything like those vial points. Those were added uh, thousands of years later for people like me who aren't fluent and need help how do you say this word out loud and so they came up with this system and each one of those little dots are associated with a vowel and so you can come to what's called an unpointed text and you can know how to sound it out so in Israel once you become fluent in Hebrew and you buy a newspaper this is what the newspaper looks like it doesn't have vowels in it and if you see someone with a newspaper that has a vowels on it you say oh that person doesn't really understand Hebrew very well because they have to have the training wheels for them so I, I've been studying Hebrew 35 years I love the vowels I need the vowels <laughs> I need somebody to help me. Okay, put an A here, put an E here, put an I here. But when you have an unpointed text, it means that often there's an ambiguity how you read a word. And often you can hear it in the text when they um, interpret a word two different ways. What they're doing is they're playing on that ambiguity and saying, uh, this word brings this image to mind. It also brings this image to mind in an unpointed text. And that's true of the word the Mariah. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, to the Mariah. And so as intelligent readers, one of the things we have to ask is, what does the word Mariah mean? All names in the Bible mean something. What does the name Mariah mean? And to kind of illustrate this, I want us to do this exercise in English and then we're going to apply it to this word Mariah. So imagine I had this sentence on the board. And I ask you, tell me what this sentence says. What would you say? You've got to supply your own vowels. I love my cat. I love my cat. Uh, 99 people out of 100 are going to come to this sentence and say, this sentence says, my lo I love my cat. If we come to the word Mariah and ask, what will the vast majority of people understand by the word Mariah? And this is going to go exactly to this emotion question. 99 people out of 100 are going to say the word Mariah is the word, the bitterness of Yahweh. Yahweh's bitterness. Um, you might know in an English text that Naomi Ruth. Uh, mother, uh, her name means my lovely one or something. And, and uh, later in life, things haven't gone well. She says, don't call me uh, my lovely one anymore. Call me Mara because Yahweh has made my life bitter. That M-R um, uh, root in Hebrew is, is usually about bitterness. I love my cat. We're adding those vowels to that word. Is that the only thing that sentence could say? I love my cut. You're sadomasochist, right? And, <laughs> and you are in love with your cut, right? Could it say that? Absolutely it could say that. Suppose you're in Minnesota and it's 50 degrees below zero. What does that say? I love my coat. Co co uh, <laughs> suppose you're an undergraduate student and you mismanage your time and there's a paper due and you pull an all-nighter and you turn it in. 
I love my Kant. Uh, maybe you are a very patriotic person. You could say, I love my city. It could say, I leave my city. It could say, I leave my coat. Depending on which vowels you add, it could say a lot of things. Mariah is like that in that the 99 out of 100 meaning is the bitterness of Yahweh. But it also could mean Yahweh is the teacher. This is Yahweh teaching something. If you supply other vowels, it could be Yahweh is providing something, that whole Jehovah Jireh. Uh, and so you have this word that has um, double entendre in meaning. Now, um, the reason we can trust the little dots is because when you come to a paragraph, it's not just by itself, and you know the wider context. So if, you know, it's, you, are you talking about cats, cuties, coats, cities, uh, cuts, what, uh, then you know it kind of dictates what the rest of it has to be. But in just a word by itself, often you'll have more than one meaning uh, intended at the same time. Another question we could ask is, where is Moriah? And the word Moriah only occurs in two contexts in the Bible. Genesis 22.2 and then you are going to use your cross references to find the other place that appears. And it's going to tell us that cross reference will tell us exactly where this place is where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac. Where's the cross reference? The only other place in the Bible where the word Moriah appears. Second Chronicles 3 1. And what does Second Chronicles 3 1 say? Then Solomon began to build a house, the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Orna the Jesus. So where is Moriah? Jerusalem. And specifically in Jerusalem, where is it? It's, it's on the hill, the top of which was built the temple. Okay, are theological bells... <laughs> Are theological <laughs> bells going off for you right now? Take your son, your agapitas son, take him to the place where the future temple would be built. There, offer him as a burnt offering. And you get to keep his skin as the payment for serving as priest. Why in the world would they name that place the bitterness of Yahweh? Is it not because that's exactly what happened? Nobody stopped Yahweh. Yahweh offered his son, his only son, whom he loved. Where did that son bear the wrath of God? It was 400 yards. Four football fields from the temple. That's where Jesus died. So I'm trying to make the case that a Christocentric hermeneutic is what helps us understand the details of the text. So help me. What connections do you see in this Christocentric, metanarratival, plot symmetrical unity? What connections do you see? 
Isaac carries the wood on which he would die. Jesus carries the wood on which he would die. I wish I had time to make this presentation more complete. If I did, I would quote the Jewish source that says Isaac carrying the wood up the hill looks just like a criminal carrying his cross to execution. That's not, that's not a Christian document that says that. That's a Jewish document that says that. Yeah, care. Uh, yeah. Yeah. God crushing. Now, the Trinity has one essence and one will. So people often say, "Oh, this is cosmic childhood abuse." That were that would be true if the Trinity were untrue. But there is one will in the Trinity, and the the Trinity equally wants the redemption of mankind. So this isn't. Uh, father abusing it. This is one unified trinity wanting to redeem the fallen world. But to do that, it meant that God the Father had to watch his son, his only son, go to the place of execution. I can't think of what it would be like for a father to flay his only son. What was it like for God the Father to watch the wrath of God fall on his son, his perfect, obedient son, his son who was willingly bound, who willingly submitted. Do you want some time just to process? <laughs> Right, the, the faith that God had worked into Abraham is unthinkable. That's why whatever you say about Abraham's failures, you can't say anything about his faith at this point. He is, he is hyper-obedient to God and willing to give God the benefit of the doubt in that God must be intending to raise my son from the dead. I'm, gonna, I'm going to obey God but God's going to be true to his word and therefore he's going to raise my son from the dead. So this is David's city. And these graphics are from the ESV Study Bible. They're a good resource. And notice here is where the temple is. Do you recall that, and did we say last week that there was a connection between the tabernacle and temple and the Garden of Eden? Did we make that point last week? Okay, so if the temple is in Jerusalem, what else might be connected with Jerusalem? If, if it's the sacrifice of Isaac, what else, at least in terms of... Uh, connections when you, when you think of Jerusalem would you grant that there's an Eden connection here and did you know that one of the four rivers that come out of Eden, Eden is the Gihon River and do you know the only place the Gihon is mentioned in the Bible other than Eden it's the little sickly stream outside of Jerusalem where Solomon is anointed king. All the Jewish texts believe that Jerusalem is built over the side of original Eden. Let's suppose that's true. 
what would be true, uh, Josiah, if Jerusalem and Eden were the same place in terms of Moriah and Abraham and Jesus? What would be true? It would mean that the same place the fall happened in the same place where God slaughtered the first innocent animal to clothe the naked man and his wife is the same place where God the Father acting as priest could say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And would it surprise you that the word put on the skins of the sacrifice of Yahweh who served as priest, would it surprise you that put on the Lord Jesus Christ is exactly the same word? And if Eden and Jerusalem and Moriah and the crucifixion are all in the same place, somehow in this meta-narratival plot symmetrical meta narrative elegance you have all of this stuff happening at the same place that's the 43 miles you can see the uphill it's almost the same if you've ever uh, gone that uh, just as you, if you drive from Chattanooga to Dayton it's a slow long uphill that's exactly the same path that they took those 43 miles and then as we close this section this is Rembrandt's uh, pen and ink drawing and notice he has just a little wood here and he's made Isaac a boy a small boy I think that's what everyone does on the initial reading but it's not really thinking what is required of a, a burn offering and when um, Rembrandt repainted it. This is how he repainted it. I'm convinced he must talk to a rabbi because he's made uh, Isaac uh, much bigger and he's put a lot more wood. Uh, Rembrandt has made a mistake that the angel stopping him is right there and the text says the angel is in heaven but nevertheless uh, he's helping us see in this painting, the anguish of the father. And uh, I love the idea that he's covering his son's eyes so that his obedient son will not look into his father's eyes as he slaughters him. And you think about that and you wonder, no wonder this place is being called Yahweh's bitterness. Uh, because for God the Father uh, to make a way for you and I to get back to Eden, uh, it's beyond bitter um, what it took and yet the Trinity loves us enough to overcome that bitterness uh, to get us back into um, Eden. Now this is from the ESV study Bible and this is the temple and if you want to know how far this is the front of the temple is 60 feet um, and I would imagine that this building, well, Jeremy, you're much better at estimating. What would 60 feet uh, be in regard to from the wall here uh, to maybe there? Would it be maybe the outer dimensions of the building? 60? Okay, so if that's this distance, 60 feet, how far would it be from right here? to the traditional site, the site where people have been making pilgrimage since 100 AD uh, to revere the crucifixion. How, how far apart would those be? You can tell that it's almost the distance you could throw a baseball. Um, it is so incredibly close. Uh, in fact, um, Jesus died on Passover and the Mishnah tells us that during Passover when the lambs were being slaughtered um, the worshipers would sing the 15 Psalms of Ascent 
And uh, the Mishnah even tells how far, when they had the biggest crowd, how what sentence they got to uh, singing all the way through three times. Jesus could have heard that on the cross. Every time uh, they're going one step higher toward the temple, they're uh, singing one of the Psalms of Ascent. Jesus, it's close enough. Uh, it, it's from right here to the front of the grocery s store or uh, maybe less than that distance uh, away. In other words, it's virtually the same place where God sent uh, Abraham and where Jesus would die on the cross. Uh, this is a very good drawing from the ESV Study Bible. Um, this is the back of the temple. So in a way, it's like God is turning uh, where this happened and um, the traditional side of the tomb of Jesus. Um, today, they built a huge church over the top of it. It's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, you go in, uh, it's bigger than a football field on the inside. Uh, over where the tomb was, they built a church inside the church. Um, when people visited the cave, everybody had to just have a pebble. And over time, pebble here, pebble there, until it was completely gone. The only thing left now is the place where Jesus lay. It's the same place. It, it is as close as you can get to the temple. And we're told in 2 Chronicles 3, 1, that Moriah is where the temple was built. This is where God sent Abraham. My favorite drawing of this is by a Russian-born um, Jewish painter, Mark Chagall. Um, he was a Jew. He never converted to Christianity. Uh, he moved to Paris, he painted in Paris. Um, he painted lots of Old Testament scenes, but he brought his understanding as a Jewish person to the story and said, you know, if I were a believer, how would I connect these two stories? This is his painting of the Akeda. What do you notice? This is just a regular Jewish non-believing, not a Christian, just saying, if I wanted to connect these two stories, this is how I would connect. What do you notice? Right, so we have, uh, we have a cross here. And so he's making the connection of the binding of Isaac uh, and the cross of Jesus. I don't know if this is God the Father and Jesus. Um, I, I don't know who this is, Mary. Um, but he's making the connection between Isaac and Jesus. But he's making some more incredible connections if you look carefully at the painting. Who is this figure, do you think? Eve. And Eve is at the tree. Is that the tree of her rebellion, would you think? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Is he making the point that the cross, uh, a place where you see something immensely evil and at the same time you see something immensely good, is he making the case that God has turned the tree of the knowledge of good and evil into the tree of life? Is he making that case? It could be the tree of life and the, the lamb by the power, that's what horns mean, is caught in the thicket thorns by his power. And could it be that he's the one who's stopping saying, no, no, don't harm your son. I'm going to be the sacrifice. For years I quibbled with uh, if this is Eve, because I, I believe she's wearing clothes here, and I thought that when Chagall painted her, she should be naked. Uh, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized, well, of course she's clothed. Because is this before or after the fall? This is after the fall. 
and she's somehow looking to the sacrifice of Isaac and ultimately to the sacrifice of Jesus. But Chagall makes another interesting thing that's very, very telling here. What's he doing? He's recognizing that two people are speaking authoritatively. Yeah. One, the angel, and is this another angel or is this God? And of course, if you bring the Christian meta narrative there, um, it is the Trinity, Elohim, and it is the Malak Adonai who is included in Elohim so that he can say, you have not withheld from me and yet speak of Elohim as separate from himself. All of that's in this story. So it seems to me that on this very difficult text, uh, we see this is not about the meanness of God. This is about God giving Abraham the ability to feel what it was like to almost sacrifice his son. And then he says, no, I'm going to spare you, but know this. What you felt in a small-scale earthly manner is what I felt for eternity, knowing that my creation of a race that will fall will inevitably result in me having to serve as priest and my son having to die to bring you back into the Garden of Eden. And then it goes from a view of God, who would want to serve a God like that, to, oh my goodness, if God loves the world that much, who could resist a God like that? And God teaching us by feeling so that we could feel what he has felt. All right, let's uh, take our break and we'll come back and we'll do uh, the passage.